I had a busy day today. I came right from the White House here. Um, Malcolm Holmline was here tonight, and I and a small group of others were invited to meet with the President today for over an hour. It was an off-the-record meeting, so I can't tell you precisely what the President said, but I can tell you what he said that he has previously said and what he emphasized and repeated. And he talked quite a bit about Iran and his commitment to the state of Israel, and I would put it differently, his commitment to world peace, to make it clear to the Iranian mullahs that the President of the United States does not bluff. And when he says that Iran is not going to be permitted to develop nuclear weapons, and the President assured us that containment was not an option. Obviously, there were people concerned about that because his nomination of Chuck Hagel to be the Secretary of Defense and Hagel's performance in front of the Armed Services Committee where he didn't seem to understand the difference between containment and prevention and needed the help of several senators to clarify his views not only confused many of us but probably confused the Iranian mullahs as well. They hear what they want to hear. And that's why it's more important than ever for the President of the United States to say in no uncertain terms, not only to the Israelis, but to the Jordanians, to the Palestinians, to the Turks, to the Egyptians, to the Syrians, that Iran will never be permitted to develop nuclear weapons. And he must also, in no uncertain terms, tell not only the Israelis, that's easy, but tell all the countries surrounding Israel that the United States will never, ever compromise on Israel's security. That's not only important for Israel's survival, it's important for world peace. Those of us who have studied the history of the Second World War understand what happens when you begin to give in to tyrants and when you begin to compromise on issues of principle. Israel, like the Jewish people, has always been the canary in the mine. And if Israel were ever to be abandoned by the United States, it would mark the beginning of the end of the civilized world as we know it today. That's how important not only Israel's survival, but Israel's ability to thrive in a dangerous neighborhood is to the world today. And think about the following. Israel is about to celebrate its 65th birthday. I challenge anybody to name any country in the history of the world that has accomplished as much for humanity as Israel has in 65 short years. No country in history has ever even come close. When one thinks about other countries on their 65th birthday, including our own great country, there is simply no comparison. Israel saves more lives per capita through the export of its medical technology than any country in the world today. Israel saves more lives and helps produce more agriculture through its drip technology than any country in the world today. Israel does more for the environment than any comparable country in the world today. Israel is the first country in modern history to elect a woman head of state who was not related to a previous man head of state. Think about that. Golda Meir was the first woman ever elected completely on her own. She didn't have a father, a brother, an uncle who was a head of state like every other woman previously who was elected. And think of the issues that are very important to our college students today. Israel has led the world in equality based on sexual orientation. Israel never had a don't ask, don't tell policy for its army. It always treated people equally based on meritocracy. If they deserved it, they got it. 
without regard to race, national origin, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation. And Israel has led the world in fighting terrorism within the constraints of human rights and civil liberties. Tonight, I am speaking after I finish here tonight, I'm going on television to speak about the American drone program and whether it's constitutional for the president and for the attorney general, as the administration says it is, to use drones against combatants even if the combatants are in the United States or even if the combatants are American citizens. It's a very complicated constitutional issue. But where do you think the United States learned how to deal with this technology? It learned it from Israel, which used targeted killings for the last 25 years very effectively. You know, when the great Justice William Brennan, who's probably the most liberal justice in modern American history, went to Israel at the invitation of President Aaron Barak of the Israel Supreme Court, he came back and he gave a talk in which he said, this was before 9-11, he said, if God forbid terrorism were ever to come to the shores of America, there is only one country from which we can learn as Americans how to strike the proper balance between human rights on the one hand and effectively fighting terrorism on the other hand, and that country is Israel. When you think about how the world should be in awe of Israel, how the world should be admiring Israel, how the world should be praising Israel, and instead you go to the United Nations, where Ron Prosor does a brilliant and magnificent job defending the state of Israel in that den of thieves, in that corrupt organization, where black is white and white is black and good is bad and bad is good. But when you think about how Israel is treated at the United Nations and what impact it has on our students, our students have been brought up in an environment where Israel is regarded as the worst human rights offender in the world. After all, why should it be condemned more than every other country in the world combined if it weren't guilty? That's the attitude many students have. When I debate on colleges around the country and around the world, the first question I'm asked is, if Israel is so good in human rights, why does the Human Rights Council condemn Israel more than all the other countries in the world combined? The answer is, who serves on the Human Rights Council? Who does the condemning? Syria, Iran, these bastions of democracy are the ones telling Israel how to fight the war against terrorism. But the big lie has an impact. The big lie has an effect because everyone knows the struggle for the future will be won or lost in the minds and hearts of college students today, university students, professional students. That's where the battleground is. That's why it's so important when my alma mater, Brooklyn College, has its political science department sponsor an event calling for the divestment and boycott and sanctions against Israel. Or when City University of New York next month is having a conference in which it claims that Israel is good to gays only to cover up how bad it is to Palestinians. It's called pinkwashing. And they're having a whole academic conference sponsored by the City University of New York with taxpayers' dollars the philosophy department, the psychology department, are all sponsoring this phony academic conference. Why? Because it's clear to everybody that having an impact on young college students is the key to the future. And we owe it to our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our children, our nephews, our nieces, never to let that battle be lost. We must answer falsehood with truth. We must answer lies with emet, with veritas. We don't have to use propaganda. We don't have to use hasbara. All we have to do is tell the truth. All we have to do is get the facts out. All we have to do is let these young people go to Israel. Let them visit Jerusalem. Let them go and see what happens all over Israel. Let them see what a tolerant, pluralistic society looks like. 
Let them go to the airport the way I went to the airport and see what happened when thousands of Ethiopian Jews who didn't even know how to flush a toilet or turn on an electric light were brought into Israel and how they became integrated in our society. Let them see what happened. I remember 1974 when I went to the Soviet Union repeatedly on behalf of the Aserat Zion, on behalf of the prisoners of Zion, on behalf of Sharansky, and on behalf of all of the thousands of Jews, hundreds of thousands of Jews, who wanted to make Aliyah. And they finally did. And look what happened. Look what happened. How well they are integrated into a country. Is it perfect? No. Are there no problems? Of course there are problems. But when you think about what Israel has accomplished in so short a period of time, you have to ask yourself the following question. What would a peace dividend look like for the world? What would the world look like tomorrow if, in fact, the prophecy came true and Israel was permitted to turn its swords into plowshares and its nuclear weapons into nuclear medicine? Imagine what the world would look like in the future if all of this brilliant technology, this high tech, this nanotechnology, this medical research, if Israel could be devoting all of its energy and all of its budget, not to defending itself against scud attacks from Gaza and potentially from Lebanon, not worried about what the border with Syria will look like after UN keepers and watchers are, are kidnapped, we don't even know which side is the side that's going to promote peace and which side is going to promote terrorism. But imagine what the world would look like if there really were peace. And I'm optimistic. Why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because although the world, and Europe particularly, today thinks that Israel is a barrier to peace, history will prove them wrong. You just wonder, you go to services anytime at a Jewish synagogue and count the times that the word shalom is used. The opening song here tonight, shalom, shalom, that's all the Jewish people care about is shalom. But let me tell you about another prayer that's often neglected. It's from the Psalms <clears throat> and it's so prescient. Hashem oz liamo yitain, Hashem yivarech et amo shalom. God will give the Jewish people oz, strength, and only then will God give the Jewish people peace. What a brilliant insight that was. For the Jewish people at least, and I think it's true for the people of the world, there will never be peace without strength. Jews need power. Jews need strength. Jews need political power. Jews need economic power. Jews need moral power. Jews need all kinds of power. They need military power. And only if they have the swords will they be able to create the plowshares. Only if they have the nuclear weapons will they be able to have nuclear medicine. That is the key lesson of the Shoah. The two key lessons of the Shoah, the first that Elie Wiesel taught me and taught all of us, is always, always believe the threats of your enemies more than the promises of your th friends, which means that Israel must always be self-sufficient. No matter how many times the President of the United States looks me in the eye, looks Malcolm in the eye, and says to me, and says to Malcolm, and says to Bibi Netanyahu, I don't bluff, I have your back, you can count on the United States, the answer is always going to be, no country can export its safety and security. Israel must depend on its own ability to defeat the enemies who are strong and who have sworn to defeat it. That was the one lesson of the Shoah. The other lesson of the Shoah is in the 1930s, many Jews, many Jewish leaders, many theologians believed because the Jewish people had right on their side, because we were morally correct, because the Nazis were wrong, we would prevail. By the way, when Martin Buber went to Gandhi and asked him to speak out on behalf of the Jewish people, he wouldn't do it. 
Gandhi wouldn't do it. He said, you have morality on your side. Don't worry, it'll all work out. Well, six million Jews later, it didn't all work out. And it really showed the Jewish people forever and ever and ever the need for O's, the need for strength, the need to put strength before peace. You cannot have peace without strength. That's the message I think we all try to convey to President Obama today. I think it's a message that the Israeli government will convey to President Obama. You want Israel to make peace, great. Make sure it's strong. Make sure it's qualitatively superior to all the combined Arab and Muslim armies in the world. Then Israel can make peace. Don't ever ask Israel to compromise its security. How dare any country, how dare any country ask Israel to make compromises with the lives, safety, and security of its children and its citizens. And one final, one final word. I was recently in Israel and I had dinner with the Prime Minister and whenever I have dinner with the Prime Minister, I always leave and ask him the same thing. What can I do to help Israel? His answer to me this time was very interesting. He said, the most important thing you can do to help Israel is keep the American Jewish community strong. Keep the American Jewish community strong. Bibi Netanyahu and the people of Israel would love Brownstone because that keeps the American Jewish community strong. They would love this organization because it keeps the American Jewish community strong. They would love it because it creates a connection between a brownstone on the east side of New York and buildings in Jerusalem, white stone buildings in Jerusalem. That's the connection we have to maintain. So my message to you is be strong, never be apologetic about Jewish power, increase Jewish power. If they say we have the most powerful lobby in the world, the answer to that is we have to get more powerful. If they say we have too much economic strength, our answer is we have to get more economic strength. If they say there are too many Jewish professors at major elite universities, the answer is we need more Jewish professors, really Jewish professors, professors who act like Jews as well as who were born Jews. We need more power, not less power. And organizations like this are our future. We owe it to our grandparents. We owe it to our parents. We owe it, most importantly, to our children. So may this organization and may Israel go from strength to strength. Thank you very much. What do you think causes like this are so important? Well, first of all, I think it brings uh, Jews and the pro-Israel community together, and there's never been a more important time to do that. Second, this is an organization that does such incredible good, uh, both in Israel and uh, for the Jewish community. So I'm thrilled to be part of it. At a time when we have to show solidarity and unity, this is an organization that does that. It brings people together, it doesn't divide. But we always have to show solidarity and unity. Why this time is so special? I think with what's going on all around Israel, uh, in Syria, in Egypt, um, there's no more important time than now. Israel has a PR campaign that's going around the world and there's been a, a controversy around it. What do you think about it? I don't think Israel needs PR. I think Israel needs to just tell the truth about what it does. Um, and um, PR never works, but truth works. Well, so far the truth haven't, uh, hasn't worked. Truth works. You have to know how to tell it. And, but it can't be spun. It has to be direct and honest. What do you think should be told about Israel at this point? Well, first of all, how anxious Israel is to make peace and that the Israelis have offered the Palestinians statehood on numerous occasions and it's always the Palestinians saying no and it's always the Israelis saying come to the bargaining table. Uh, every day Bibi says come to the bargaining table and every day Abbas imposes conditions and the world has to understand that. If it, w if it were to happen, do you think there will be a two-state solution as a result? I do. I think it's inevitable. Oh, of course. I think it's the best thing for Israel, because if Israel wants to be both a Jewish state and a democracy, there has to be a two-state solution. What do you think on the position of uh, President Obama in regards to Israel and Iran? Do you think he shows enough support? I think that on Israel's security, President Obama has been quite good. 
I believe him when he says he's not bluffing and that he will not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons, yeah. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.